Okay, so welcome to day two, uh, bringing the science home um, sci cyber symposium. Um, I'm going to help kick off the day with you. Uh, my name is Lily from um, Penn State University, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, I work at the Interface Hydrology, Biogeochemistry, um, something similar along the line Jenny Johan was talking about yesterday. So we have, um, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our other hosts, uh, Kamini Singha from Colorado School of Mines, Pam Sullivan from Oregon State University, um, Nicole Gasparini from Tulane University, and then Nicole West from Central Michigan University. Um, just remind you all that we have a hashtag on Twitter, um, join C0 Science. You can come, um, grab whatever talks you, you, you're interested in, um, whatever time you're available. And remember that all the talks are recorded. So if you miss some and end up or you want to look at them later, we will announce later website that will have all the recording of the videos. Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, the goal of this uh, cyber symposium is really First of all, to introduce concepts of critical zone science. Um, we hope to build communities for undergraduates, graduates, early career scientists, postdocs, and all that. Um, we would love to connect scientists from different fields to ask questions, to, to also answer questions together. And um, hopefully we can also inspire the next generation of inclusive leaders, you know, as you see in this right figure, um, six signature traits of inclusive le leaders, um, which I wouldn't have time to talk about in detail, but you can look it up and think about along these lines. Now, first of all, what is critical zone and what is critical zone science? So um, some of you I'm sure have uh, attended some of the earlier, you know, spring seminar series before, you probably have no more of this. And so, so you guys are different degree, probably knowing it's easier science. So define see, critical zone science is defined as, you know, the zone of um, on earth surface that interact with life. The zones that from the treetop to groundwater that, have, that sustains life. Now, traditionally, um, we have been working on, you know, scientists have been working on um, in terms of asking questions in within disciplinary, uh, disciplinary boundaries. If you think about, you know, atmospheric science, ecology, soil science, we are thinking about, you know, questions in that uh, science domain. But if you think about the, the natural system, from you know, sunlight coming, precipitation happens, and how all these energy and water penetrating through the different zones of the critical zone, essentially they are all interacting with each other. Trees are interacting with soil, um, taking water, going back to the atmosphere, also weathering rock and all that. So essentially, you know, the traditional disciplinary research in a way, if we look at the critical zone as a system, it wouldn't work as well because we're interested in interactions, feedbacks, but also, you know, looking into the future, thinking about what happens in this human um, impacted or climate change is happened really quickly. Thinking about the future, what are the tipping point and, and all these key questions um, we will need to bring different signs together. So as Eve Lin yes, said, yes, it's more like a system approach. And to do that, we need very diverse skills, ideas, background coming together. So that's a whole, you know, the goal of this, this symposium is bring you guys to here to the critical zone science who are not originally in the critical zone. So we can expand the critical zone community um, in terms of thinking about developing and promoting approaches to quantify CSIO science, um, to explore interactions and feedbacks among different processes, also to think about, you know, explore how the CSIO is changing in this Anthropocene. Um, and uh, how does small scale processes, for example, things that we measure at a watershed catchment, how do they eventually, 
how are they important at the larger scales? So when we need to think about global scale projections, we can use some of the science in smaller scales. So, and, and all these efforts, hopefully to diverse the CZ community and to answer important CZ questions. Okay, now also thinking, keep in mind that science in, is in the bigger context of society. So we are now at an unusual time. We need to navigate unjusted realities, just giving you some data, thinking about, you know, hate crime has in the US has increased for the third year in a row. Um, six, about 60% is directed to race, targeted to race related. 20% um, is religious related. So we need to bring and, and to ourselves, the community, um, have self-awareness, social awareness, and <clears throat> excuse me, self-management and relationship skills to think about how we can build a community, how we can have conversations about differences how we can confront um, hate and uh, injustice, all these you know, issues, society, bigger society related issues is, is, is not isolated, science is not isolated from that. We need to think about in a bigger context of that. Okay, so what I'm going to do for the next few slides is really to give you a recap of from yesterday. And this is the first thing we did, community did this poll everywhere thing, uh, looking at, you know, where are you coming from? Where, where are you visiting us from? And we essentially covered four continents. So we have a lot of representation of places, different places, different culture, different, you know, um, um, different type of science um, in, in this regard. And then we have, we started to have Holly Bernard um, talking to us about how do trees take and keep water and move water. And one thing that I found really interesting to me that I learned is, um, you know, she talked about Darcy's law actually works for, um, for the water movement in trees. Um, I've, we've been exposed a lot to thinking about, you know, does this law doesn't work. So this is the great news. Um, she also talked about um, how trees do different during the day and at the night, how the water storage, you know, taking water versus the keeping water uh, during day and at the night. And how does trees take water different in dry places versus wet places? In, in, in wet places, you know, trees, tree loose can be shallow. They take water from shallow soil moisture. Um, but in deeper places, um, there, there are not a lot of water in soil. So trees have to really grow deep loose to tap the deep, deeper groundwater. Also the rock soil moisture, the rock moisture in the deeper zone in order to keep the water and keep their the, the life. So this is really interesting. Um, and along that line, um, Jenny Juhan has kind of, you know, uh, was talking about the same side, how do trees, what does trees do, you know, in addition to taking the water for trees, they also actually respire, they actually also um, um, uh, release a lot of soil CO2, um, keep the soil CO2 at a very high concentration, for example, if you look at the figure, it's 5% CO2 at a depth of 15 meters, much deeper than the typical soil science, you know, measure at the top, you know, uh, several horizons, tens of centimeters. So this is really cool in terms of think, thinking about the deeper processes and how these soil CO2, because they are deeper and at a high concentration, that keeps the rock very reactive, even at very deep conditions. Um, she also discussed a lot about, you know, vacuum transfer principles, which I could spend the whole day talking about this, but I figured we, we wouldn't have time for that. Um, and then Jordan um, Hayes is, is saying, oh, you guys are looking at the solutes and functions of, of the CZO of the critical zone subsurface. I actually can image all this invisible um, subsurface. So she's like the, um, the doctors using x-ray scan. If you think about geophysics, that's, that's what geophysics do. 
um, you, you look at, uh, you take, you know, take some field site, use these different geophysical image uh, methods to image, you know, where is the bottom of the soil zone, where is the interface of the soil and rock boundaries, um, how big is the uh, porosity in different zones. And if we think about, you know, all these lay them together with these images with typical measurement from geo geochemical approach, for example, weathering profile, you really can see, you know, the different um, way of looking at subsurface bring together. So CZO science in a way is not only bring the science together, but also brings approaches from different field together, which is really cool as well. Okay, um, and then, uh, Evelyn was talking about um, all these, what do you guys measure, looking at things, these are at forest sites, they are rel relatively, you know, pristine, not as much impacted by human activities. Let's bring this systematic approach to, to cropland, to agricultural sites, using, you know, all these different ways of thinking about measuring the structure and functioning, looking at the soils, looking at the water, looking at the isotopes, all the different, um, different uh, ways of measurements and, and look at how these influence, uh, how the agricultural activities influence, you know, the agricultural land. Um, and also she essentially talk about um, communication with farmers. What language do you use? Um, how can we, how can we, communicate them in a way that they understand so they can take the science insights from us to use in their practices. And this is important in a way, not just to farmers in, in agriculture, but also you know, in broader society relevance. If we think about um, climate science, we, we advocate change. the climate is changing really fast, but we haven't seen you know, enough of policy changes and all that. Um, so it's in a way, you know, the, the communication between science to, and to the broader public, to the, to the broader community is essential to bring science, to see their science to, uh, to, to society relevance. And then at the last, Leho was talking about um, how these understanding of these cesio science the processes, uh, for example, how the precipitation interact with the soil properties or soil micro properties, how they change um, the, the, the soils and water fluxes. Um, how does do all these processes come into play if we think about larger scale, continental or global scale? So he was talking about, you know, how can we bring this to the global scale, or science, uh, or system models, and think about all the different processes when they come together, what's, what become really important at that spatial scale. And keep in mind that, you know, the CZO um, is not just limited to the 10, 9 CZO observatory that, that is funded by um, NSF, but also, you know, across the globe, we have seen everywhere in different, different continents, they have been using CZO science, CZO approach to, to look at the, the interaction between different processes across disciplines. And then we had some fun talking about how to be, how to be a science, science, scientist and, and the role Snyder had been talking about left brain, white brain, which remind me of Dr. Sue's book, One Fish, Two Fish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we will talk about left brain, right brain, how to be a scientist, the keeping the harmony between creativity and structure, um, and the, the harmony between the work and life, which is really important when we think about all this. Um, and then we have this very talented Joe Kaspersik. I don't know if I pronounced last name right, and his band, Paper Moonshine, if you want to, you know, listen to these songs again, you can go to their website. I love these songs, these so the watery, very watery songs about, I love this title. <laughs> we had a lot of fun yesterday about this. Um, so go visit his, their website and you know, Joe also have a Twitter uh, account, you can trace him um, back about all this. 
And then at the end, Nicole um, Gasparini and Leonard Scala have brought you guys to a conversation of what about, you know, after all this science, after you've done all this, what are the next steps in your career? How do you even think about um, what to do next? It's a very confusing question. I'm sure many of you are in kind of at this stage or even or think about this. So um, this was kind of directed to have a conversation along these lines in terms of how do you think about this? And then um, the last point I want to bring is really, you know, we see brilliant science yesterday. The, you see what's presented here, but all the brilliant science are coming from very, very hard work. You don't see, you know, what, what's behind that, how much will it bring to that. And in that process, uh, there are a lot of up and downs. Um, I remember uh, Ro Snyder was, when he was talking about art to be a scientist, I think someone, maybe Joe asked about, what if you're stuck somewhere? And his answer was, come, come out of that as soon as possible. <laughs> so, um, but I, I want to say up and downs are very normal. If you're at this stage right now, don't, you know, when you look at these presentations and science, don't think, oh, everyone else does everything brilliantly except me. It's not. It's, it happens to everyone. Some, everyone stuck somewhere, someplace at some point. So just keep that in mind. You are not alone. And, and doing science is, is doing research is, is exploring into the unknown. There are a lot of things that dead end you can get into and you, you realize, okay, it's not working, you come back, that's very normal. So um, it's important to keep that in mind and keep the perspective, I think. Okay, so um, this is a schedule of our day two. Um, after um, this kickoff, we, our first talk is Julia Peugeot. Um, she is an assistant professor from um, uh, University of uh, Vermont uh, in geochemistry. So she will start the second talk talking about big pictures and details, bringing different skills and all that. Okay, Julia. It's